you know, last time we talked, well, we had discussed, among other things, Meta. And one of the things you had said was, you know, I think when we chatted, it had crashed down from like 380 down to 220 or something like that on its way all the way down to $90. And you had said that it was an, you know, it'd be an easy double from current levels, which at the time was like $200. And, you know, lo and behold, it has doubled and then some since then, but I wouldn't say it was an easy double. <laughs> it definitely <laughs> well, I had think, its, I think, its first. I think, I yeah. think Mark did a really great 360, 180, you can say where he really tightened up the expenses. I mean, I mean, Meta is a great platform. You know, I think right. it's got a great franchise, great platform. They had a kind of country club attitude to spending, you know, and there was a, wasn't that much discipline around. When you have a great business like that, you don't necessarily need to watch your pennies. And it's amazing how they like turned on a dime and actually like tightened the, tightened up all the ex expenditures and the layoffs and uh, basically got the ship pointed in the right direction. And uh, I mean, then you had the cash flows just show up, you know, so it was awesome to see that. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I've, I've written about a couple of, you know, numerous times I've, and I've, they are the fastest pivoting company I think I've ever seen. I, I can't think of a single business that has pivoted as quickly at, at anywhere near this scale as often as, as Meta has. So I remember in the depths of, uh, you know, the, the bad news when the stock was at, it was like $88 a share. The, the, uh, the Wall Street Journal put out a headline, you know, stating that they were going to reduce their employee base um, and fire like, I think it was 11,000 people at the time. And as soon as that happened, you know, the stock started moving. I think that day might've been up 8% or so, but you know, it took a while, I think for people to realize that they weren't just paying lip service to cost cutting, but that there was, you know, a fundamental change in terms of just the company being permanently leaner. And a complete change in the philosophy of Mark, uh, you know, in terms of what sort of was possible with a smaller team. And like over the months and, you know, the years, you know, over the last two years, he's kind of said on numerous, numerous occasions that, you know, he just feels like a leaner, meaner team is better. And it's starting to obviously percolate through the rest of big tech. And now people are calling for Google to do the kind of the same thing and, you know, really kind of cut the fat. You've seen some of it in Amazon, but I mean, what's your take on which of these companies uh, has the most kind of operational leverage within it and, 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 or, and also maybe as a corollary, have the most room to improve from a cost standpoint? Well, I think, I think Amazon uh, runs a pretty tight ship as does uh, Microsoft. Um, I, I would say that in my different visits to Alphabet headquarters, uh, that's definitely a country club. And, and, uh, really? and yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I would, I would say that they've done some, I mean, I think that some of the Google employees I've spoken to, they don't feel secure in their jobs in the sense that the layoffs have come very suddenly. They've actually gone after some very senior people in, in who they've cut. But I think there's a lot of fat there to be cut. I mean, that's that's an incredible, another incredible set of franchises with search and Android and YouTube and all that. So, so, so yeah. I mean, I think that the the company where a top line is equal to bottom line, you know, in effect, basically, like where there's no expenses to speak of, is Microsoft. You know, Microsoft's just a incredible machine. I mean, you know, when you see their revenues go up and like 80% or something will drop to the bottom line. Uh, I think Satya and, and his team, I think uh, they've always had uh, great execution. Even when they've had, you know, they've been doing really well, 
they haven't had a lot of meat or, or fat on the bone, uh, if you will. They've run, run lean. But, but yeah, I think Alphabet has a ways to go. But by the same token, maybe that's an argument to own Alphabet. Low-hanging yeah. fruit for them. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah. I mean, they, they actually trade at a multiple that's more in the low 20s versus, you know, take a Microsoft kind of mid to high 30s for... Yes. You know, that's 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 got. Yeah, but there's a um, there's a little bit of a difference. I mean, I think that Microsoft is such a strong recurring revenue business. You know, the 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 recurring nature. I mean, it's. I think the the Meta franchise is awesome, but but it's at the end of the day, it's a it's an advertising franchise, and and on the Mm -hmm. on the Microsoft side, it's very critical part of enterprises, and. Is that that revenue is not going anywhere, you know. So, so you could you could argue that it's higher quality. Yeah, I've heard that argument, and I, I think it's more like earning stability is is kind of the if you're going to pay a premium multiple for it, you you kind of you can you can argue for that. Yeah, I do think there's something to be said for Meta being, and, and you know, I think this applies to Google and 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 Amazon's been picking up on this as well being kind of the, you know, the distribution channel for corporate enterprise and enterprise as well as small business. Like if you want to reach an audience, you got to go through like one of these channels. Yeah. Um, and, and also, and- also it, it used to be that, you know, half your advertising worked and you didn't know which half and, <laughs> and that's gone. You know, I mean, that was, a, that was the whole yeah. adage with, with advertising, like, you know, there was so much waste and the thing with platforms like meta you don't have that waste because you have such a direct relationship between you know what you're spending and what you're seeing come out the other end and the the ability to pinpoint that is really powerful and i think that's a core part of what their franchise is yeah now one of the other things you said uh, previously when we when we chatted you know, was, you know, sort of your indifference to the metaverse uh, or maybe skepticism towards the metaverse. Now that conversation has shifted to AI. So it's not really about the metaverse so much um, now as as it is about AI. How do you think about that vis-a-vis the MAG7 or or kind of these, you know, kind of these, these blue chip names? Do you have a viewpoint on who's best positioned to take advantage of that? Well, I would I would say that Microsoft, you know, has historically been a great cloner. It has not been a great innovator, but they're exceptional at cloning. Sometimes it takes them 10 versions to get it right or 15 versions to get it right, but they get it. They get it. So I I, I would I would definitely put them in the winner's camp just because they're so good at the execution. I mean, I mean, what I'm saying is the company has woken up to the potential for AI and they're, they're doubling down in a big way. So, so I would, I would put them near the top. I I would say that obviously Google has had a lot of strengths in this area for a long time, but they don't have the, the execution discipline and the intensity of, of going after it the way a Microsoft does. So so it's a it's a no-brainer for me that with the partnership that Microsoft has that they've got a they've got a good pole position here. Do you, do you think that that Satya Nadella is on a personality level maybe a little bit more ruthless versus a Sundar Pichai? Like what is it that because you know you hear this in the news about how Google's kind of dropped the ball on this AI trend. I'm I'm not sure what to make of it because I feel like they have incredible technical expertise across the board, and they you know they use AI a lot with search. But there does seem to be a personality difference between the management team at Microsoft and when I have heard Sundar speak, and you know, he's done congressional testimony. You know you see him with, at conferences and whatnot. He comes across as maybe a little bit more relaxed, but I'm just curious if you have any thoughts into that. Yeah, you know, 
if there's a cultural quite, difference. Quite accidentally, I didn't expect this, but quite accidentally, when I was in Omaha in May, I usually go for a dinner that Charlie would invite me to. And there's a lot of who's who who show up at the dinner. They they seated me next to Bill Gates. So <laughs> I was quite, quite, a, quite a surreal um, a situation where I had had dinner with Bill and of course his son was sitting next to him. And I chatted about all kinds of things with him for about two and a half hours. And we, we talked a lot about many of these areas and and I even played a game with him. I said, look, I'm going to mention a company. You tell me if you want to go long or short. And, and you know, so, uh, you know, and, and he, he said, he said, yeah, no problem. You know, so I, I said, you know, Amazon. Yeah, he said long, you know, and I said, Google, he said short. And then, then Apple, he paused. He said, he said, look, basically Apple, the situation where they don't really have R&D in the way we uh, we would most of us would understand it so he mentioned that microsoft has had microsoft research labs forever right and i also pointed out to him then that nothing has come out of microsoft research labs ever you know that has been <laughs> that has been of any use and so he actually was quite agreeable to that even though that statement probably didn't make him happy he said, look, we have two kinds of research at Microsoft. We have the ivory tower Microsoft labs, which is like a, you know, academic bunch of PhDs, you know, whatever doing their thing. And you have your opinion on that. That's fine. And then we have, of course, development and then R and D tied to development. And he said that has been really effective. So that's the engine, which has the more, you know, bread and butter engineers who are the masters of cloning, right? So basically, Google has always had a huge leg up on the pure research for a very long time, and they've done a really good job. The transition from the real research, from this in a very innovative research into a bit a business, is not something Google has been able to pull off too many times. They pulled it off for search. But then after that, if you look at it, YouTube was an acquisition, Android was an acquisition, and many of their other bets are just wild. You know, like there's like a free for all spending, but nothing has really come out the other end. Microsoft, on the other hand, doesn't take flyers. You know, when they see that something is gaining traction and they don't, they may put some people on Microsoft research into it, but I don't think Bill and company and Satya and company count on those guys. They they pull in people who are more, you know, died in the world development engineers with some research background. And those are the guys who pull the teams and, and things through. So I think that from an execution point of view, uh, I just think that uh, it's just a lean, mean fighting machine. It's, it's really exceptional. And they will be able to do this and they've done this repeatedly when the paradigm has changed. The paradigm has changed on them so many times. If you think of Microsoft, you know, it's like a, a nearly a 50 year old company. I mean, I think this year is like year 50 for them. 48, sorry, they're 48 years old now. It's like really old. You know, so, but you know, for a 48 year old business with all the paradigms they've jumped through, they look like a young company. You know, they look like a really young executing company. And uh, so it's just got some great DNA on that front. Yeah, they're not they're not resting on laurels. Actually, on a, on a related note, and this, this transitions to some of your other investments, somebody asked on the topic of top line revenue increases going straight to the bottom line, the Almaty Airport in Kazakhstan of your Turkish holding TAV airport seems primed for duty free as well as potential air and passenger fee increases that may go straight to the bottom line. Yet, you know, there's a Pavlovian response to macroeconomic news. How do you think about their TAV's valuation lately? Do you ever double down on bets that are 10%? You, you obviously make large bets. So have you have you doubled down there or what's your, what's your take on that? Yeah, let me just give you some background. 
I think so that people can kind of understand uh, the business a little better. The Almaty Airport was an acquisition that uh, TAV did in the middle of COVID when passenger traffic was zero. It was like basically you're buying this airport when there are your revenue is zero, basically. And so they got, I would say they got the deal of the century in terms of what they paid. Most of these airports that come up for privatization are BOTs. They're build, operate, and transfer, which means you get a concession for like 25 years or 30 years or 50 years, and you pay the government something for that concession. And after that 25-year period, it goes back to the government. And so you are a, a tenant, if you will, milking the the situation for you know two or three decades or something. TAV, the Almaty Airport, was an outright purchase. They own it forever. They own it for the next thousand years. They don't have to pay anyone anything anymore. And part of the deal for them to get their airport was that they wanted to put in a new international terminal, which is going to actually go live in about six or eight months. They've been building it. I visited that airport in 22. And and the, the Almaty Airport is mm-hmm. a very unusual airport in the sense that I think I don't know of any other airport in the world where inside the airport some of the real estate was sold to so for example the the current duty free operators in the current terminal own that space inside the terminal even though TAV owns the airport and TAV today at that airport gets zero duty free revenue now what TAV is doing is it went and talked to those guys saying, hey, listen, can we do a deal? And the price was so high, they said, okay, you keep the duty free, it's okay. When the new terminal comes up, which is happening in eight months, all the international moves to the new terminal and all the duty free automatically goes to the new terminal, which means that TAV will now own 100% of the duty free. And the people who had those duty free shops in the old terminal, which will become a domestic terminal can basically go pound sand. They'll convert them probably to coffee shops or something, <laughs> you know? So it's like, it's like there's nothing. And, yeah. and just to tell you, just to uh, show you how duty-free works, just in case of some of your listeners are duty-free aficionados. When you go to some, you know, duty-free shop and there's a hundred dollar bottle of Johnny Walker or Chivas or something, the factory gate price of that liquor is 25 to 30 dollars okay so what you're paying a hundred dollars for which would cost even more in your home country uh, the factory gate price is 25 to 30 dollars the airport operator charges 40 percent of top line as their rent due to duty-free operator so tav has its own subsidiary which runs a duty-free shop so what tav will do is it'll bring in its own subsidiary as a tenant that that tenant is 50% owned by TAV. So 40% of all the duty-free revenue will come to TAV as rent. Now that that Johnny Walker bottle, $60 is left for the duty-free operator who pays about $30 for it, $25 or $30. They have $10 or $20 in expenses to run the place and they make a 10% margin. So the airport operator, the duty-free part of the business is an incredible business. Every flight, every international flight that comes in, on average, about $1,500 gets spent amongst all those passengers on duty-free. And the airport operator ends up with about $600 per flight as their fee, which if you divide it by, let's say, 100 passengers or something, it's like $6 per, per passenger. The terminal fees, which is also what they charge for international, which normally is about seven or eight or nine dollars per passenger. Currently in Kazakhstan, that number in Almaty is like three or four dollars. And that is being bumped up about 20% a year by TAV. They're, they're not taking it to eight in one shot, but it's going up. So basically, if you think about the per passenger revenue the international per passenger revenue, which TAV is going to get when the new terminal is up, 
it'll be like something like $6 per passenger from duty free and probably another five or $6 from the passenger fees, uh, which used to be three. So what used to be $3 per passenger will soon be $11 on its way to about $15. The other thing that has happened is that the, the traffic at Almadi, the, the passenger counts, they just actually today released some numbers. The 2024 passenger count and aircraft movement numbers are about 40% higher, 30 or 40% higher than 2019, which was the last year pre-COVID when things were normal. So they, they are basically uh, getting an airport in 24, which is 30, 40% larger in size in terms of passenger throughput and aircraft movement. Almaty is also the only, one of the only airports where TAV does the fueling. They don't have the fueling rights at the other airports. It's very unusual for the airport operator to have the fueling. It's like you have a monopoly gas station for like 500 miles. And that fueling business has like a 40% margin. It's beautiful. Okay. <laughs> and and all these flights from Russia got diverted wow. and whatever. So the long and short of it is that TAV, the entire company, used to have a market cap which was like 600 to 800 million US dollars. Just the Almaty Airport is probably, if they wanted to put it on sale in a few years, would go for, I don't know, three to five billion. And they have 15, 15 other airports besides Almaty. So we are long wow. and strong with no plans to lighten up. That, and the current market cap is 600 million? No, oh, the market cap used to be 600. It's moved up. It's approaching about 2 billion now, but, but it's still very low. It's very low for the size and scale. And, and you know, Turkey just dropped all visa requirements for U.S. citizens. Their tourism business is through the roof. So 2024 wow. numbers are looking like about 30% higher than 23. So all their Turkish, all their Turkish airports are on fire. I mean, they're just doing exceptionally well. Yeah. And all their international passenger revenues are very high. So the company is executing really well firing on all cylinders. It's a very good management team. And uh, yeah, basically that Almaty airport that they bought for 400 million, including the CapEx, which was two thirds finance at like 4%, 30 year fixed, was just an incredible deal. Um, what percent of your total portfolio is Turkey now, roughly? Oh, it's, I think probably more than half. Like, yeah, it's, it's not more than half because I put money into it. It's, it's more than half because it's, it's you know, Resas used to be a, like, you know, 16 million market cap and it's about 30 times that now and, and such. So it's moved up. Yeah, I, I, I haven't checked lately because some of our US bets have done very well as well, but like 50, 60% probably at this point, but still very undervalued. Yeah. Speaking of your US bets, what's your favorite US name now in, in the portfolio? I don't like to talk about what we, what we own so much, but if you looked at our last 13F filing, which is only our, that only shows our US positions, it only had coal. We had some coal bets that showed up on that filing and, uh, and we'll have another filing that will show up in another week or something for our year end number. But yeah, we, we had a pretty extreme mispricing on the coal front. And so, uh, and a lot of things were misunderstood about it. So we went into that. So basically metallurgical coal, which is what is used to make iron and steel, we will be using that 50, 60 years from now because there's really no substitute. And, and, those stocks were trading at like two times earnings, you know, and they were doing wow. massive, they were doing massive buybacks and so on, two times earnings. 
uh, doing buybacks at two or three or four times earnings is really good for your health and your wealth. Right. Yeah. Wow. How did you, did, was that something where you knew about the coal industry from the past or how did that hit your radar in the first place? You know, I don't have any original ideas, Devia. Everything is cloned from somewhere, <laughs> like my buddy, Bill Gates, you know, he also has no original ideas. You know, we're yeah. very similar that way. And, uh, and uh, I, I had seen, I had seen a filing, I had seen a filing by David Einhorn and his largest position was a company called Console, Console Energy, which is a big thermal coal producer. And uh, so I, I just basically wanted to answer one question for myself. I said, why is David Einhorn so hot and heavy on stupid coal? You know, and so I went down a rabbit hole to try to answer that question. And I emerged from the rabbit hole with, you know, massive coal bet because it was just such a no brainer. And one of the things about coal is that, you know, if I, I don't have any endowment money or anything in my fund, but if I had uh, some of those guys in the fund, they would have exited because of all the ESG mandates. And so we have a lot of irrational kind of uh, behavior in terms of what people can and cannot invest in, which leads to mispricing of some of these securities. Did you talk to David Einhorn at all? I, just... I, I, I didn't speak to him. I just, I just basically went, went in and just said, okay, let's try to understand what is going on. And, I, and I'd seen some commentary he had made. His, his complaint... His complaint was that these companies that he's buying that are really cheap from a valuation perspective because of all the, you know, emphasis on the big seven tech, et cetera, they are kind of left by the wayside, right? Nobody's really interested in these companies. And he was kind of moaning and groaning in some of these public comments of, well, how do I get paid? You know, how do I get paid when I own these names when no one's interested? And you know the answer was you get paid when they when they buy back stock, when the valuations are very low. And Console is a interesting company because they forward sell all their production at least a year in advance. So we already know, for example, in 2024, even though it's a commodity, we already know within a band what their cash flows in 24 are going to be because they've already sold it. They've already said what the prices are. We already know what their costs are. And and they're like, that's a business which says that 100% of discretionary cash flow, they canceled the dividend is going to buybacks. So we we had a company that had a, a 1.8 billion market cap last year that had not of 600 million in earnings last year, you know, pumped into buybacks, you know, so that's, that's very potent. Are you still involved with or invested in India energy exchange? Are you still, still in that one? I think what I'm, what I'm finding is that we are finding more things that make uh, a lot of sense in the U S and in places like Turkey, India is uh, a company with some great tailwinds, but also it's not a cheap place. So we have some great businesses and great franchises there, but mm -hmm. some of the valuations are pretty heady. And so we've been net sellers in India and net buyers in the US. Very interesting. We had a question from the audience, actually. Have you, I mean, obviously now that you're in coal, have you looked at other parts of the energy sector? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the dynamics are a little different in the sense that, so I think that, you know, there are some sectors, so I'll, I'll just uh, mention coal briefly. Uh, the um, accepted wisdom is that the world is moving away from coal-fired power plants, and and that that is actually absolutely true. And therefore, this, this is a sunset industry where you basically have, if you will, a melting ice, ice cube. 
and melting ice cubes are not great to invest in. But I think what the market misses there is that they they miss the the fact that coal has a lot of uses outside of producing power. For example, it's it's a industrial input into the production of cement and uh, a bunch of other things. So it's it's actually a critical, and of course for making iron and steel. So it's actually in reality not a melting ice cube. So what I'm saying is that when we see a distortion between what is generally accepted common wisdom about a particular industry or a particular company, and, and when we see a, a delta between that and what the reality is, and the delta is significant, then you have a basis to do something. So for example, another area which is very interesting is, is, the, is the large auto dealers. So when you look at the large auto dealers, they are very mispriced. They are at single digit multiples. And in some cases, you know, five or six times earnings, very cheap. Now, the accepted general wisdom is that everything is going to EVs. And a lot of those EVs are going to be sold directly, not go through dealerships. And even if the EVs get sold through dealerships, they don't need much service and parts. And a typical auto dealer makes something like 40% of their cash flows from parts and service. So parts and service is something like 10 or 15% of the pie from a top line perspective, but it's almost like 40% of the pie from the bottom line perspective. Now, the reality is that EVs need a lot of parts and service. Um, it's not that you can just buy an EV and you're not going to, you know, ever going to have maintenance. In fact, if you take a, a electric vehicle and you take a 20 year life on an electric vehicle, after about year 10, it starts getting really expensive because each of those cars has four or five battery modules, battery packs, and each battery pack is about $7,000 to replace. And that's mostly happening at the dealership. So if you look at a 20 year life of an ICE car, and how much a dealer will get off that and a 20 year life of an electric car and what a dealer will get off that, the electric car is no less than an ICE car. And probably more of it will go to the mm -hmm. dealer than, than, and they would, uh, you know, the oil changes, et cetera, low margin businesses. So basically the second thing is that the concept of electric cars going direct. So that also is a flawed concept. Some of these guys who thought they would go direct are now looking at going through a dealer network. And basically, actually, an OEM who goes direct doesn't save much money because the dealers don't make much money on new cars. You know, a, a traditional Ford dealer, a very small portion, portion of their total profits come from the sale of new cars because those are such heavily commoditized people compared to shop. You don't have any margins on those. So basically... And OEM going direct versus going through a dealer network on the new cars, there's not much delta. So what I'm what I'm saying is that in my opinion, just like coal, I don't think the auto dealers are a sunset industry. On top of that, we've had a delay in how quickly the EVs are going to come on. You know, Tesla is laying off people. Their growth this year is very low in the US compared to last year. And all these other guys, Ford, GM, Stellantis, they are, you know, pulling back on how aggressively they want to go to EV. So I think these large these large uh, car dealerships who are which are very well run enterprises those are great franchises and again it's this there's a delta between the reality of those businesses and the perception of those businesses. And I think whenever we see uh, industries where that Delta becomes large. So going back to oil and gas, I don't see so much of a delta in the oil and gas. I mean, I think oil and gas is well understood. And I think it'll be with us for a while. I don't think we're going off the usage of natural gas or petroleum anytime soon. But that's well understood by the market. I don't see a delta between 
what the market understands and what the reality is. Not a big delta anyway. And so that's what I what I what I focus on is that is there an aha moment? Is there something where there's an anomaly where, like you know, when you look at something like Tab Airports and you look at something like Almaty, that's a big aha moment because you look at an airport like that and look at what kind of what kind of cash flow that asset can produce and you look at the pricing of that asset, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. So when I see these big price and value deltas for reasons that I can understand, like in that case, there was, you know, the whole issue was Turkey and, you know, who wants to buy an airport in Kazakhstan and all these other things that are going through people's minds. Um, I think when you get to those uh, anomalies, then you can you have a basis to do something. So I think metallurgical coal is an anomaly in terms of where it's priced and what it's worth. I think the large car dealerships are an anomaly about where they're priced and where they're, what they're worth. And, and I think Turkey is an anomaly like that, right? So I, I'm basically Monish Anomaly Pabrai. That's who I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that, that's certainly true. So on the dealerships, I mean, are you talking about like AutoNation or a CarMax? Well, what, I think I think I think names? AutoNation AutoNation is not that great in terms of. I mean, I think so. There are four uh, there are four large dealerships uh, that are public companies. We have Lithia, we have Asbury, we have AutoNation, and then we have Group One, and then we also have Penske, for example. But if you take the top four. I would put Lithia at the top, uh, probably the best of the four in terms of execution. Then I would put Asbury number two, and then probably probably AutoNation number three, and maybe Group One number four. That's probably how I would rank them. But I think if you bought a basket, all four, you'd do just fine, no problem. Do you feel the same about the auto OEMs. I think you know. I think the OEMs the OEMs are a really bad business. And the reason they are bad business is that if Tesla makes a 10% margin. So in the end in the end we will all be driving EVs. And and that transition may happen in 10 years or 20 years or whatever you can debate that but that transition is going to happen. Okay? Whenever that transition happens in en masse, if the margins of a company like Tesla are like 10%, then the margins for a company like Ford and GM will be negative because the execution here is so much better. So I think that most of these players who go up against Tesla, except companies like BYD, maybe the Koreans, will have a very hard time making any kind of profit margin. So I would not be surprised if in the end, the, 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 the Fords and GMs of the world really have a tough time. They may even become terminal because you know if you have a negative margin and the ICE cars are gone, you know that's, that's a really tough place to be. And so, and I think when you have Elon, you know, who is an anomaly, when you have someone like Elon that you're competing with, the only thing you should do is go find something else to do. You know, it's not good for your health or wealth to compete with Elon. And then, and then you know, we have Chung Fu Wang at BYD in China. Chung Fu Wang is Elon to the power of Elon. So when you wow. have to compete, when you have to compete with Elon and Elon squared or Elon to the power of Elon, you definitely want to take your ball and go home. Go find something else to do. And so, yeah, the auto OEMs, I think long run, they have a they, they have some difficult, difficult times ahead. So coal, Turkey, we talked about India. Now on Turkey, we didn't we didn't we didn't get to uh, discuss race sauce. Any change in your views on the company, or it's still just one of these long-term kind of uh, stories that you plan on sitting on for many years to come? My my view of the people who are running Resas and the quality and nature of the business, you know, I've been a shareholder now for almost five years, you know, made the bet in 2019. 
and we haven't made any changes you know we we would like to hold that for as long as we can my perspective on the business the quality of the assets the quality of the people running it how good they are has only gone up every year and so i think it's it's an exceptional set of assets um really smart capital allocators i have never seen them in the last 5 years make a single mistake i i just haven't seen them do anything dumb you know and 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 and, and the other thing which is really great about turkey is that we had these you know very crazy monetary policies coming out of erdogan's government etc but after he got reelected he put a new team in place and that new team is really an exceptional team and they basically have raised interest rates interest rates now in the in turkey are in the mid 40s and they are taking a sledgehammer to inflation the way they should have and so probably in another year or two they already starting to see some green shoots on that front in terms of inflation is really hard to get back under control once it gets wild and crazy but they're going out it pretty aggressively so i think their the policies they have in place are working quite well so turkey may actually you know all these investments in turkey i had made was assuming that the macro never improves you know the bets worked because even like for example tab airports is listed in turkey but kazakhstan mari has nothing to do with turkish monetary policy you know it's just a it's like it's just the baby got thrown out with the bath water if you will and so i think that there there may be some real tailwinds because at some point it looks like in the next year or two the actual monetary situation will be a lot better and if we ever get people coming back to turkey the foreign investors and institutional investors then some of these names these are the most blue chip names you know these are the ones that people will want to own and uh, but we don't need that to happen it it would still work even without that so yeah i mean i think i think that the the good news with turkey was that we could because it was so cheap uh, we we went after the very best assets and these are kind of iconic monopoly type assets like you know we own the coke bottler we own the largest beer company we own the best airport operator in the region and we own very prime warehouse assets all across turkey so these are just great assets have you speaking of kind of hard assets have have you looked at all into like the the real estate industry in the us commercial real estate where there's been a lot of you know a lot of turmoil anything in that space where you feel like there is maybe been a potential dislocation i think you have for- to you have to segment it i think the the office vacancies i uh, i think what the number they read is something like 20% 20% is a ridiculously high number we didn't see that during the financial crisis we haven't seen those types of vacancy rates in offices in the us for more than 3 decades you have to go really far back to to get that so it's nuclear winter so i think office my my suggestion and perspective is to just stay away you know it it will take a long time because we had a secular change in how people work and it will take a long time i mean the us population the growth rates are really low so we used to as a country because you know immigration is not solved and all of this thing if the if the country was growing at something like 1% a year which it used to do then eventually this space would get you know chewed up and we would get back to some kind of normal situation i don't know if even 5 years or 10 years from now whether the office market it will definitely be less the vacancy rate will go down but it may still not be healthy so i think that's that's a nuclear winter for a long time if you look at some other areas like i would say like home builders i think that's that's a much more promising area to look at because what has happened with the home builders is that many of them 
are getting religion like NVR. You know, NVR was the poster child which did so many buybacks and the stock went from, I don't know, $10 to 4,000 over the last 30 years or something. And many of the other, like Pulte and some of the other guys are following that playbook now. So I think home building is a much better area. I haven't made any bets there yet, but basically they don't really have an overhang. We're likely to see interest rates come down and we don't have a lot of housing stock and such. So that once we see interest rates go down, the home building industry may be doing even better than it is today. So I think in the office market in the US, you kind of have to avoid some of the office stuff. You kind of go more residential and then kind of take it from there. But it's not a sector I'm playing in right now. Shifting gears a little bit. We were talking to the Winklevoss brothers earlier today, and they were they were complaining about the fiscal situation in the United States. And you know, I, I was saying that you know, we we've been talking about debt for decades, and you know, when will we come to a point where the government will actually have to grow up and rein in costs? Do, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, do you feel like we can continue to amass deficits year after year at the scale that we are? without any repercussions? And how do you put a, a duration on how long it can last? Well, it's, it's, it's a much bigger problem at higher interest rates that we have now. And, and, and I think that it's not good for a civilization to uh, test the limits. You know, the, the US has a pristine credit. We are borrowing in our own currency. We're never gonna have a default because we we own the printing press uh, but but i think that it could cause issues it could i mean i think it makes the monetary policies a lot harder it makes it more likely that we have runaway inflation and so so yeah i mean i think that a small deficit is probably okay and but i think that there needs to be some structural changes in the way we you know, do our taxes and all of that. And that requires Washington to be functional and it's not functional. So it's, it's an, it's unfortunate sort of, sort of situation, but yeah, I'm not an alarmist about it. I think that the country has a lot of strengths, but I think we definitely need some grownups in DC. Lastly, Monish, you've, you've written extensively about Charlie Munger, and, and obviously with his passing, uh, we wanted to just, I don't know if you could tell a story about a time, you know, a, a dinner or a moment you shared with him, but just if you could give us, you know, maybe even an idea of like what he meant to you and, and also, uh, you know, some of the wisdom that he imparted on you, I'd, I'd love to hear it. I'm sure the rest of us would as well. Yeah, uh, I miss Charlie a lot. You know, I used to see him a few times a year for dinner. We'd play bridge. And in fact, I had my last one-on-one uh, -on -one dinner with him exactly a month before uh, he passed away, which I didn't know at that time it would be my last time seeing him. And we had a great time, actually. His his mind was very sharp and and he was always very kind. He was always very funny. Charlie always had the best jokes. I mean, he just had a huge repertoire of jokes that he would he would you know say on demand. I I always have a hard time remembering great jokes, but he was really good at it. I remember one time a few years back, I was uh, we used to we used to meet on Fridays at the LA Country Club on to play bridge, and it we used to start by having lunch at the at the in the dining room, and then we'd go play four or five hours of bridge. So I was sitting in the LA Country Club dining room and across from me was Rick Gurren and Charlie Munger, you know, just, just sitting across the table from me. And I told them, I said, you know, you guys, you guys think this is just okay. You know, there's a bunch of people having lunch before bridge, but I'm sitting with two, you know, historic icons. And, uh, you know, this is like a surreal moment as an Indian guy grew up in Bandra in uh, Mumbai, you know, sitting with you guys, you know, just shooting the breeze. So I said, you know, when you guys were doing your deals in the 60s, where you say 
you were shooting fish in a barrel with the water drained out. What are some of the, they tell me about some of the deals that stand out, you know, and they looked at each other. And then Rick Gorin tells Charlie, tell him the story of the nurse. Okay. And so, so Charlie, Charlie goes on to say that there was a, there was a company in California where this maverick entrepreneur had come up with a auto additive that would go into an engine where if you put this kind of liquid in the engine, it would seal all small leaks. Like it would make the engine not leak anymore. And, and this guy basically was like a super salesman. So what he used to do is he used to go to these auto mechanic shops and whatever, and he'd take his gun with him and he'd shoot the gun into his engine block of his car. And, and then he would pour the liquid into the engine block and show the mechanics that, look, there's no leak. And, you know, his sales took off. Like, you know, like, like people like, there's no brainer, right? But the guy was a kind of maverick and not a very good manager of cash flows and all that. Uh, he suddenly passed away, you know, kind of untimely death. And the business owed a lot of money to the banks. And basically the business was, for the most part, bankrupt and so what rick and what rick and charlie did is they bought up all the bank debt like you know 30 40 cents on the dollar and they had control of the company but the 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 widow the widow of the of the guy technically had the ownership of, of that company and they did not want to play hardball by saying hey we own the debt and that's the end they wanted to make some small payment to the widow to basically get a proper sale from her. And so, so Charlie said that when, when the guy passed away, um, the, widow, the widow finds out that the, uh, the guy was having an affair with a nurse and he 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 had he had basically in his will um made the nurse the executor of his will and the widow was going to get the title to the business but the nurse was the executor so the widow was extremely pissed off okay and the nurse was also extremely pissed off they were both pissed off with each other. And Charlie and Rick, in the middle of all this, they just trying to get their kind of deal done. But the women basically were not interested in cooperating. So Charlie said, okay, I'm going to meet them and, you know, try to kind of pacify them and say, yeah, we know he was a jerk and whatever to the to the widow and get it done. So he, he arranged a meeting with the nurse at the California club. The California Club is a club in uh, downtown LA. That's the first place I met Charlie when I first met him. It's, you know, he used to love going to have lunch there. It's a very kind of, you know, blue blood, old money kind of place. And Charlie always had the same table in the dining room. He'd probably eat lunch three times a week over there. And the nurse was blonde and well endowed. I will not use the language Charlie used on, on this video, but let's just say it was a lot of colorful language he used. And she showed up for lunch with Charlie in her nurse's uniform because she came straight from work. And the uniform was about three sizes too small. Okay. And, <laughs> and, and so, so, Char, so Charlie is saying that all the members of the, of the California club was sitting having lunch there. They like gasped, you know, when they saw this woman enter and then sit down with Charlie. And Charlie said, they thought I'm having lunch with some porn star. Okay. And, and so he said, yeah. he said, anyway, I met her for lunch. I pacified her. Then Rick and I met the widow. We pacified her just enough for the two women to cooperate, get the deal done, and then we moved on with that. 
additives company. You know, so this would be kind of like the stories I'd hear from them. And, uh, but Charlie was, you know, I think, I think just, we would not have a Berkshire Hathaway uh, as we know it today, if there was no Charlie Munger. If, I don't think the market cap of Berkshire Hathaway would be even 10% of where it is today without a Charlie. The, the, the impact, it was really one plus one became 11. He pushed Warren towards the better businesses, the better people and all of that. And he pushed him in a way where he never took credit, you know, and uh, like he was always happy to be the, the partner in the background, whatever. And uh, uh, so I think he had an enormous impact on Berkshire. He had a huge impact on a lot of institutions that he got involved with, you know, the Harvard Westlake School and then uh, UCSB and Stanford and University of Michigan and, and so on. I just never really wanted to talk about it. You know, there's all these great things he was doing. And a few times, a couple of times, I brought up personal challenges I was facing. And he was just so helpful to me. I mean, just always there and just incredible advice. And I, I just always followed what he said and things worked really well. But another time he was, I give you one of the Munger jokes, you know, he was saying that there was this Jewish couple and they had this kid who really didn't like to study much. You know, his kind of grades were like pretty poor, even though the parents were pretty smart. And the the parents were kind of frustrated. So they found there was a really good Catholic school in the area and they moved the kid to the Catholic school. And after the move to the Catholic school, the kid suddenly started doing extremely well in school. In fact, he used to come home, the kid used to come home, drop drop his bags and stuff and just go to his room and start working. And math was a especially a hard subject in the sense that the kid had no interest in math. His math grades used to be the lowest. He had some of the best math grades. So after a few weeks, the parents sat down with the kid and they said, you know, we noticed that, you know, you're doing so well, you're engaged with this, all the math and everything. So what changed? Like, you know, do you like the school? They said, he said, you know, when I went to the school and they, I saw that they had put that guy on the plus sign and I just knew that they were really, really serious about math. And so he basically said that I didn't want to be crucified. And so I just decided I'm going to focus on the math, you know? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what, a, what a storyteller. Um, Manish, thank you for, uh, for all the, the color. Story, you know? this... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but, you, you, you know, Manish, you're, you're one of the best storytellers in the industry. So we're getting a compounding effect here between you and Charlie, which is. Well, I had to, awesome I had to, to take see. out all of Charlie's colorful language, you know, which, which was, which was quite. Yeah, I, I can fill that in. I'm, I'm sure we can all fill that, fill that in. Yeah, it's funny because he's he, he he. It's funny you say that he's he's happy to be kind of in you know the backdrop, not necessarily the foreground of Berkshire Hathaway. But every time he talks, you can tell he he isn't holding back. I mean, I've I've seen well, so I, many I of his. Well, I actually asked Charlie. I asked Charlie what I said. I I told Charlie in all your partnerships with all the different businesses that you're in, you are the dominant partner. You are the Type A main main partner. And the other guy is, you know, subservient to you in some ways. The only one which is not that way is the Berkshire Hathaway partnership with Warren Buffett. So I said, how could you, knowing the personality you are, how could you accept the role of a junior partner? Because you've never been a junior partner in any of the other ventures with any of the other guys that I've met, right? He said it was a no-brainer to be a junior partner to Warren Buffett. Some things are total no-brainers. That was a no-brainer. So he said, yes, even though it went against my natural grain, I just knew that that was the right thing to do. Yeah, yeah. Monish, this is, this is phenomenal. Always such a pleasure to have you, uh, you know, chat on Sun Zero and tell us all your learnings. Yeah, amazing. I, I will, I'll follow up with you after this. 
but thank you again and, and thanks to everyone else on the call for for tuning in we'll certainly be back next year for top stocks 2025